this person could have saved your life. Like we have to like, we have to do something uh-huh. monumental to thank them. Yeah, and I was course. like, what do we do? And she's like, we should salute. And so we turn around and the doctor's looking at us and we're across the ER and he obviously has like lives to save. And we're like, so so much for coming in today um i just want to start out by saying you fill my cup online watching your content and taking in everything you're posting i feel like it's you fill this space for so many i mean obviously women in particular Mm. who maybe i don't know need something that's really raw and authentic and that's just so what i get from you whenever i watch anything like gives me goosebumps talking about it like i just so nice i really really it does like i go with goosebumps it just really, I really I love watching and just absorbing your content. So I just wanted to let you know that. Thank you. That's so nice. <laughs> yeah, 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 of course. One thing I noticed is that you said in an interview, the mm-hmm. biggest strength that you have is mm-hmm. confidence. Where did that come from? Like, have you always been pretty confident or is it something you've developed over time? No. Do you know what? I wouldn't even describe myself as a confident person. Mm-hmm. I think if you asked me, are you confident? Yeah. My first answer would be like, no. Yeah, right. But I do think confidence is something it's like a skill Mm -hmm. that you learn and you can whip out when you need it and I think for me the motto like fake it till you make it just rings so true Mm -hmm. in every aspect of my life Mm -hmm. in like my job and career and you know relationships and I think we're all kind of like faking it I know I um was talking to one of my friends and we were saying like this is the like the year of delusion totally like the more delusional you are the better because when you're delusional you're like well I can do it. You have to be. In my brain, I've already done it. Yeah, exactly. And then that comes back to manifesting and, you know, the power of positive thinking and all of that. But for me, I think just like pretending to be confident in a way has lent itself to me feeling confident. I still probably wouldn't describe myself as a very confident person, but I can pretend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all about, I mean, it is. And I feel like once you start embodying that, it's sometimes almost evolves into not pretending but yeah. like actual and where do we yeah, draw yeah. like where do we draw the line the line is so blurred yeah yeah so you're starting a book club <laughs> online am. which mm-hmm. is so I've, I've joined <gasps> oh my gosh I'm so I'm yeah. nervous now. I'm in the I'm in the group chat on Instagram and everything <gasps> I can't see who's liking things in that channel yeah so I don't know if you've started a channel on Instagram no, yet, but haven't. it's this new feature where basically it's almost like a bulletin board mm-hmm. like a la like MySpace days and so you can post anything you want in there and people can interact with it, mm. but you can't see exactly who is interacting with what. There's like 800 members in there there's, or something. There's it's... a bit too many. Yeah. I thought maybe I started the book club because I really just want to like do more community-based activities mm-hmm. this year. Mm-hmm. And I really want to make like more friends, especially more female friends who are interested in the same things I'm interested in. And all I'm interested in right now is like reading. Yeah. And so I was like, oh, maybe if I put this online... 10 girls are going to want to join yeah. and then every like month we can have a coffee and talk about the book we're reading yeah. and all of a sudden it was 800 people. It's amazing. But it just shows that there's so many, that that, that you're not the only one that feels that way, that yes. wants that sort of companionship in a way, I suppose, of just like a community-based, totally, you know? Totally, totally. Yeah. And I think there's been a lot of conversation recently online about like third spaces. Mm. So there's spaces in our lives that we can go to that aren't monetized. Yeah. So, you know, like libraries and public areas that you can access like parks. Totally. And we're losing more and more of that. I suppose it's part of the reason you started it as well. Like obviously your love of books, but mm-hmm. like for me, my love of reading comes from like escapism and like being able to transport mm. myself into another world and yeah. like not kind of in this one all the time yeah. sometimes it's not like <laughs> the best place to be sometimes it sucks. Yeah, yeah yeah is that part of like your love of reading and that's sort of why you as oh, well totally yeah. I mean I have been a, an avid reader since I was a kid mm-hmm. and it stems back to like my childhood and it wasn't the best childhood and I used to read thoroughly growing up mm-hmm. because that was one of the only ways that I could be distracted mm-hmm. from what was going on and kind of enter into my own little world and my sister did that a lot too and some of my earliest memories are she's older than me and she would read me books for me to go to sleep she was also That's almost like a parent role for me yeah. and so when I got old enough to read then I wanted to be like her so I wanted to read all these books and then just kind of like snowballed from there but I think escapism is definitely give me the right phrasing of here because you live um, with a chronic illness is that the right way to phrase yes. it yes yeah So I would imagine reading as well, living with an illness, like it's Mm. something that you can, A, you know, enter a world and escapism and stuff, Mm. but it would be such a good kind of crutch to have for when you're not feeling your best and Mm. things like that as well. Mm -hmm. Would I be right in saying that? Yeah, I think that something that 
so being diagnosed with a chronic illness has taught me is like, obviously there's days where I'm not 100% mm -hmm. and I need to just rest. And when you rest, you're kind of meant to do nothing. Yeah. But I really struggle with like the pressure of productivity. And if I'm resting, quote unquote resting mm -hmm. for like an hour, I'm like, I'm bored. Yeah. Do you think that like sometimes when you're resting, do you try and tell yourself like you are being productive while resting because you're doing something for your body? Well, that's where reading comes in. Yeah. Because okay. I'm like, at least if I'm, I'm not lying down on my phone or mm -hmm. watching something that I'm half paying attention to. Yeah. If I'm resting, but I'm reading, I feel like I'm still kind of being productive because I'm getting through a book, but I am still like physically resting my body. Totally. So it's yeah. kind of like a win-win. Yeah. I get that. <laughs> You were diagnosed in 2020? Yeah, in yeah. May. And what were the first, like, signs and symptoms that kind of, <sighs> how did you find it? I mean, I mean, it's probably a really long-winded answer, but, yeah. It's a, it's a long story. I'll try to do the short of it, yeah. basically. So I'm a type 1 diabetic. It can be diagnosed as a child and it can be genetic, but it's not always. So mm -hmm. it's an autoimmune condition. And I like when I tell people being like, it could come for you at any point. Yeah. Like, you could just get diabetes tomorrow. Yeah. And it's not that simple, but... The short of it is you could. Yeah. And so I was 24. It was the end of 2019. I started getting these strange symptoms. They were basically like losing a lot of weight really, really rapidly. Yeah, I okay. lost about 12 kilograms in a month. Wow. Oh, my God. Without trying to. Oh, my so God. Just without trying to. I was eating more than ever. I had like a crazy thirst that couldn't be quenched. Mm -hmm. I was drinking like people think I'm exaggerating when I say this. I was drinking like seven to eight liters of water. Wow. And that can be kind of dangerous as well. Super kind of dangerous. Day, yeah. And then because I'm doing that, I'm like urinating every 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. I really full bladder. And it got to the point where I was also like having blackouts. I was having pins and needles in my fingertips. I was having all of these physical um, ailments that should have been alarm bells for yeah. me. But I am a silly little gal. And I just kind of explained all these symptoms away for months and months and months. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until it was like maybe April, May, early May, 2020. So I've been living with this for like six months. Mm -hmm. um, my best friend at the time, we were sleeping in, had a sleepover and I got up maybe like eight or nine times in the night to go to the bathroom. Oh my gosh. And that was like very normal for me at that point. I'd been doing that for months. And so I just didn't think anything of it. And when I'm getting up to go to the bathroom, I'm also refilling like this giant, like one and a half liter bottle I had next to the bed. And after like the fourth or fifth time, she's up and she's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, oh, I just need to go to the bathroom. She's like, no one goes to the bathroom this often. Yeah, right. What's happening? And I'm like, oh, I'm just really thirsty. She's like, why are you so thirsty? Like, you should be sleeping. I'm yeah, like, yeah. I don't know. And so that was the first like light bulb moment. Mm -hmm. Fast forward a couple of weeks, it was my 25th birthday and everybody was in lockdown during this time. And so like people are like baking more than ever. Yes. So people are at home. We can't do anything to celebrate my birthday. But if they're in my like five kilometer radius, they're dropping cakes off at my house. Yeah. So I have like five cakes that have been made and I'm not exaggerating. I eat all the cakes. <laughs> I eat all the I mean, cakes. how could you not do? But were they five different types of cakes? Different types yeah, yeah, of cakes. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, I'm Don't people, need to explain. People made them for me. Yeah. I have to eat them. It would be yeah. rude not to. Yeah. I legitimately eat all these cakes, cook a big meal. I'm still hungry. It's insane. I'm going to bed. That same friend is sleeping in my bed and she's like, I'm saying to her, I feel so ill. I feel like I could die. And she's mm -hmm. like, you're just really full. And I'm like, no, no, no. Something is wrong. Something is really, really yeah. wrong right now. Next day, I go into the GP and I tell them all of my symptoms and I'm like, this is you know, what's happening, maybe it's a hormonal issue. Mm -hmm. My GP, so smart, thinks to do like a, a test on a glucometer. So that's basically where you test your blood and see what your blood sugar levels are. Yeah. I've never seen one before Is in my that life. the same thing as the pinprick yeah. sort of thing? Yeah, mm -hmm. okay, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, So, yeah, yeah. you know, well, I knew nothing. Yeah. Okay. So she brings it out and I'm like, what's this for? And she's like, we're just gonna check your blood. Mm -hmm. She checks it, it's like high 20s. Yeah. And an average blood glucose level is like between four and six at yeah. any given time. So she's like, you need to go to the ER immediately. Mm -hmm. And I was like, bestie like for what though and she's like I think you have diabetes and I was like oh no no but no one in my family has diabetes like, so like can't happen to it's me. not that yeah, and yeah. she's like I legally can't let you go home you have to go to really? the ER so I had to call someone to pick me up to take me and it's during lockdown first round of COVID lockdowns as well so it's like the hospital is a scary place to be uh -huh. I'm stuck in the ER for maybe like seven eight hours with that same friend who's kind of like we're having a really good time because we're like this is so silly remember that time that doctor thought i had diabetes that is gonna send me home like mm -hmm. i just ate too much cake yeah yeah yeah, is yeah, how yeah, I yeah. i'm in the er because i've eaten too much cake so silly and we're like you know taking silly photos we have photos from that night okay. i had to get it's not funny but it is no, yeah. i had to get hooked up to like what is it an ekg or an ecg where they test your heart mm -hmm. um heart rate 
That's so scary. That I mean, super that is scary. Really oh, scary. it was yeah, super yeah, scary. Yeah. But like, you have to laugh while you cry. Uh-huh. So I'm hooked up to this thing, and I'm also like super emaciated. Like I don't. It's it's an awful picture of me, mm-hmm. and I'm getting tested by this doctor. My friend takes a photo and she puts it on her finsta, and she's like, "Carmen had surgery and it didn't go well." Making a joke, making okay. a joke because we're like, "This is so yeah, silly." Yeah, yeah, I'm being yeah, misdiagnosed. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna go home. I'm gonna laugh about this later. And then that night, they were like, "Look, we can't get their results back after doing hours and hours of tests mm-hmm. until tomorrow morning." But we are like 100% sure that you're oh, diabetic. Oh my gosh. And we legally can't let you leave until your levels come down to like a safe level. And so we're going to inject you with insulin. And I was like, you can't inject me with that because I'm not diabetic. Like something You really were just bad. in denial. Just yeah, so, yeah. I was like, something really bad's going to happen. Yeah, yeah, and they were yeah, like, yeah. no, no, like trust us. Yeah. They inject me. I get up to leave. We've been there for hours. We're exhausted. We're delirious. My friend, we're walking out and my friend's like, this person could have saved your life. Like we have to like... We have to do something uh-huh. monumental to thank them. Yeah, and I was course. like, what do we do? And she's like, we should salute. And so we turn around and the doctor's looking at us and we're across the ER and he obviously has like lives to save. And we're like. You didn't, did you really? And that is. he saluted back. No. Yeah, he saluted back. Do you remember his name? Yeah, Dr. Blood. Thank No, literally. That's why I remember. <laughs> literally Dr. Blood. Shout out Dr. Blood. Because we were also making jokes like, oh, you're a vampire. Like, what? So oh, my God. That was his name. Wait, was he the doctor that was like, I have to take some of your blood? He was, no, but okay. he was the doctor who was like, I have to inject you. He also brought me a sandwich, wow. which I was like, that's really nice. That is really nice. Yeah. yeah. So the next day I came back to the diabetes ward at the RPA and they properly diagnosed me and then my life changed forever. Wow. It's just something that you think is never going to happen to you until obviously it does. Totally. Yeah. I also knew nothing about any type of chronic yeah. illness, especially diabetes. Well, because you don't, un- unless you have to know, you don't know. Exactly. Like, and so now you're three years down the line. Yeah, three years in. Do you feel like you're getting like a manage on it or does it feel like every day is still a bit of a journey and a struggle in education? Yeah, and- I think that like... Something that really sticks out to me is when I was first diagnosed, in that first week, I spent a lot of it in the hospital and they were training me about how to treat hypos and hypers and what different terminology means and diet and whatever. So it's, everything was in one ear, out the other. Because the only thing I'm thinking is like, I don't have diabetes. Yeah. So this is useless information. And one of the things that the doctor said to me when she was explaining all this stuff was like, I know it seems really daunting, but one day doing your injections and checking your blood is going to be as easy as brushing your teeth. Yeah, okay. You brush your teeth, you don't even think about mm. it. You can do other things while mm. you brush your teeth. And mm. I remember thinking like, that will never be the case. Mm-hmm. This will always be so difficult. Totally, like not na- natural, na- a natural yeah. process. Yeah, and as if, and as if it, it, to me, I was like, as if this would ever feel natural. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now I, I look at it like, yeah, I can, I can inject and hold a million things in my other hand. I can inject and be on the phone call. I can inject and drive. Really, like, yeah. I shouldn't do that. I don't do that. Yeah, she doesn't do I that. I actually don't <laughs> do that. But it has become that simple. So, yes, in some ways it is easier to get a manage on. And then there are other things that I just don't feel like I'm ever going to yeah. get a hold of. Another thing, because you're obviously so giving with, you know, educating us on TikTok about type one. And I noticed that you were talking and opening up over Christmas about like your relationship with your parents and everything. And I was just wondering what led you to sort of starting to share a bit more about that? Was there one Mm. specific thing that kind of made you want to come and talk about that online or? I think that like for me, sharing online is something I've done since I was like 14. Yeah, you shared on Tumblr to start, right? Yeah, I was on Tumblr. You did uh-huh. stop me. Yeah, I really did. I know <laughs> I everything. Like, I've got like I'm a. So I have like a six-page document, and I'm like, if you ever got hold of my laptop, you'd be like, it's this the meme. Yeah, yes. guys, like, like joining everything. Yes. With the red string and smoking a cigarette. That's you. That's but it's me. Like, I'm like, life. you think I'm the biggest freak? I'm just like, <laughs> got this. It's like titled Zig's mom, and it's just like boom. And I'm like, oh my god. And in the middle, it's like, who is Zig? Uh huh. Um, I've always overshared online uh-huh. since Tumblr back in the day, and um, when I was in like year nine. And so it it comes very easily to me. I have never really thought twice about sharing different things about my health condition Mm -hmm. or my, you know, career or what I'm interested in or my relationship with my parents. And the reason that I've started to talk about it more so now is I think like twofold. I think one of the reasons is that being in this industry and creating content online, um, you realize that you're not alone Mm -hmm. in anything, Mm -hmm. the way that you think, the experiences you've had, Mm -hmm. like your health situation, your relationships, like there is always other people. There are always other people that are experiencing the same thing as you or have experienced something similar. And something I've learned with being diabetic is like validity that you gain, the validity you gain from finding community and what you're going through Mm -hmm. is something that 
outweighs the risk of sharing online. Yeah. yeah. And then the other reason that I have decided to be more open about this is because you can glean great advice from people. Mm -hmm. And I already see a therapist. I think everybody should. I love her. Shout out Linda. Like she loves Linda. She's the fucking, I actually (laughs) love her so much. She's the fucking best. But I think there is also something to be said about the advice you get from people who don't know your situation. Mm or your friends, Mm -hmm. or, you know, people online. Like, I've learned a lot from sharing and being open about my experience with being no contact with my parents. And so if I'm learning a lot, that means that hopefully other people are learning and receiving validation from what I'm talking about as well. And they don't feel so alone in their experience. Because I feel like it could be a very isolating place not being in touch with your, I mean, I would imagine, like, Mm -hmm. with your parents, that could feel sort of, be able to see online that somebody else is going through a similar thing. It it just, it kind of you hold that space, which I think also is really amazing thing to be able to do when you have a platform to be able to, I don't know, with the community that do engage with you to be able Mm -hmm. to hold that space for people. And like, that's one of the biggest things I love about sharing is, Mm -hmm. and the the messages I receive of people being like, I feel safe or watching your videos make me feel a certain way. That's like the biggest, like, joy that I get. Totally. I think it also humanizes us as people that show up online. Like we are humans as well. We're not just like these beings that make videos and then go off and stand in a dark room and wait until the next video. Like we're real people Uh with like complex issues. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, it makes me feel like there is more validity in Mm -hmm. what I do as a content creator as well. I get that. I really, really do. Was there one moment in time that sort of led you to make the decision that you did with your parents or was it a series of little things that led up to mm. maybe, a, you know, the, the break of contact? Mm. There wasn't, like, one moment of time. Yeah. I grew up with, like, very abusive parents, both of them being narcissistic mm-hmm. and um, addicts in their own right. And it took me, like, so long to even be able to say that sentence. Yeah. So for me, I hold a lot of, like, shame and guilt mm-hmm. in being honest about that relationship with my family, yeah. especially when you're young. You, you just want to be like, everything's great, everything's mm-hmm. perfect. I, my parents are my best friends mm-hmm. and everything's chill. It took me a long time to be able to even say that. And then I think, like, you turn 25 mm-hmm. and your brain just is like, oh, I'm done. That frontal lobe has just come together and you're yeah. like, oh, okay. Like and all yeah. the pieces come together and you're like, wait a minute. Mm-hmm what am I doing? Yeah. So there wasn't this big aha moment. It was more all of this stuff that had amalgamated from my childhood up until my early adulthood Mm -hmm. where I realised that I could minimise the effect these people were still having on me by cutting off contact. And it's not an easy decision to make, but it's one that's been really beneficial for me during the time that we've been no contact. Totally. And I feel like it's hard, like, setting boundaries Mm. because when it's your friends, I don't know, I feel like you you don't have as much leeway with your friends but with family you kind of you don't know how to structure that and totally. so you know like yeah it's... and also like our parents are of a different generation yeah so I think if I was to say to so many of my friends or my partner like hey this is a boundary of mine yeah, yeah. nine times out of ten they're gonna understand it, and totally. hopefully accept it totally. but with your parents and especially because they're your parents mm-hmm. they tend hopefully it's not always the case but they tend to be so much more like defensive Yep. to boundaries and, like, less understanding. Yep. And so even having to – I remember a conversation I had with my mum once where I was like, this is a boundary of mine. And she was like, why would you need a boundary with me? I'm your mum. Yeah, but, do you, like, maybe, like, an authority sort of thing. Like, I've got authority over you because I'm your parents. So totally. how can you put a boundary up against you? Totally, know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So right. I think it's also just a defence from them mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. It's not understanding. It's also, like, I'm your parent or I'm your family. Yeah. So – Whatever I feel or say trumps whatever you feel or say because I'm the adult. So something we've actually got in common is that we have both our partners are in the music industry. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. your partner, Joey, is Mm -hmm. that correct? He's young Franco. Yes. And they travel a lot for work. So how Mm -hmm. do you find, like, for you being in long distance when they go away, like, well, when he goes away, do you find that difficult to manage? I find it – do you find it difficult? I I find it so difficult. I do and I don't. Like, Mm -hmm. I like the start of it. I really like when he goes away at the start. I have a really good time. Hey, I'm the opposite. 
I hate the start of it. Yeah, exactly. Because I'm like, oh, I find myself when we live together as well. So when um, he's home, Mm -hmm. we get into like patterns of doing things together and we both have a very flexy schedule. So Mm -hmm. like we work together often like every day or like we wake up every morning, we do our walks together, we do our swims together and that's amazing. I'm so happy we can do that. So when he goes, the initial few weeks, I'm like, Mm oh, I feel like I'm all over the place Mm -hmm. and I'm out of my rhythm. Mm -hmm. And then it's not until like the middle of the the trip or like the end where I find my rhythm and I almost enjoy that's so interesting Mm because it's the complete opposite the start I'm like yes I can do what I want I don't have not that he doesn't let me do it (laughs) but you know what I mean like I can like just make my plans and I don't yeah I got so much time to focus on myself Mm -hmm. and like just I don't know I'm really productive and everything and then it kind of gets that you burn yourself out well then I get to the halfway point I'm like okay you can come home now I'm like good like I've done everything well I find I don't know if it's the same for you when eventually he does come home and like nine times nine times out of ten ten times out of Mm. ten I'm like thank fuck yeah he's back yeah but it takes me like a week to yeah. like get back mm. into the room oh totally that i find i'm like you're in my kitchen what are you doing that's not where that goes or even just <laughs> like i, I want to sleep in the middle of the bed yeah 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 I'm sleeping in the middle of the bed for the past two months totally. so now i have to be on one side totally i actually threw a curveball at him um the last time he went away he went away for ages it was like three months which is a, a long time for uh-huh. me and i was sleeping on the right side of the bed and then all of a sudden, I realized when he's gone, I fucking hate sleeping on the right side of the bed. I want to sleep on the left. <laughs> so I start sleeping on the left and I'm having the best sleep of my life. And I'm like, fuck, this is pretty intense. Like, how am I yeah, going to break yeah. the news oh to my, my right? Mm-hmm. And so then he gets home and I'm like, I have terrible news. You have to sleep on the left side. <laughs> I don't know how to break it to you. Are you going to wear something awful has happened? Something really bad has happened. Yeah. And he doesn't care about anything. So he's like, that's fine. And I'm like, oh, thank God. <laughs> I think this is why I've chosen you. Yeah. This oh my is God, it. This is Your amazing. flexibility is amazing. Thank but you. But now he's going, he leaves on Sunday and he's gone for two months. Mm-hmm. I'm like, what if I start to experiment with the left side? Oh, you go back? Him? I don't know. Do you think he'd care? No, but I just don't want to keep giving him the wrong Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know what I mean? I feel like if that's the worst thing he's coming home to, though, is the opposite side of the bed. Like, it yeah. could be, like, a lot worse. If yeah. I came yeah. home and he said, we have to swap yeah. sides, I wish, like, I would hope that I would be as understanding as he would, but I know that deep down in my heart, I wouldn't. Yeah, yeah. I'd no, like, I wouldn't. You snooze, you lose, I literally. Wouldn't. I'd be like, no, I'm, I sleep on, like, near the yeah. window because when the burglars come in, they'll get you first. <laughs> I swapped to the window side <laughs> because I like seeing the possums. We yeah, have possums yeah, yeah, that yeah. come every night and we're on the top floor so we see them, like, running around. And when he's not home, I like to be kept company by the possums. Mm-hmm. It's natural. But... He sleeps now on the mirror side. Yeah, and I didn't right. like being on the mirror side because I'd wake up and scare you see yourself. Myself. Yeah. Uh, we don't have a mirror like that, luckily. We we're used uh-huh. to in our old place and I used yeah. to get that same same feeling. Um, okay, so I have got a bowl of fortune cookies. Yum. So I know that you are Taurus with Aquarius moon, right? Yes. And I know that you've got heterochromia, yes. correct? Mm-hmm. Which means that your eyes are two different colours. Yes. Yeah. Did you know that? In both things, it means that you are like a sign of a prophet, and so that you I can have like, feeling. You, you can predict things. Oh my god! And so I want to see if you can predict <laughs> your prediction in the cookie. Okay. okay, okay. Do you know what these predictions are? No, I got no idea. No I, idea. I bought so them this morning from okay, the so Asian grocery. So it's general, general like cookie, yeah. fortune cookie predictions. Yeah, 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 okay, yeah, yeah. okay. So I. Oh my god! I like tune or like, in. what do you want for in. yourself? Even like, what are you wanting for yourself? And maybe it'll tell you. It's going to be something about like a journey or following a path. Yeah. Okay. Is how I feel. Okay. And if it's not, we can just keep doing it until well, I get one. If that it's is. not, just pretend you're reading out something. I could read out anything. It's there, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's true. <laughs> Actually, I will lie. Yeah. I haven't lied yet today. <laughs> <laughs> or have I? Oh, yep. You'll never know. You'll okay. never know. May I just grab whatever? Yeah. Anyone? Okay. This one. What could it be? Hating hate does not mean you love love. That's fucking <laughs> What does that mean to you? Because I, I love love and I also kind of love hate. I like hate because I think it has a place. I think there's a place like, for hate. I don't hate hate. hate. No, I don't hate. Hating, what is it? Say? Hating hate. Hating so hate. So I guess if you're against hate. You love love. I don't understand. I implore people to hate. We yeah. should hate more things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think. Like, what do I hate? I hate the wind. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, actually, me too. Uh, I hate the wind. I hate the wind or I hate the rain when you have to go somewhere. Yeah, yeah. the wind is my least mm. favourite element. Mm-hmm. I hate, you know what, I'm going to say it. I'm going to be bold. This could be crazy. I hate parents that make their kids part of their, like, online personality. Yeah. That put their kids yeah, in their, yeah, like, yeah. vlogs or their I know, content. I know. Super inappropriate. Yeah. Because yeah. especially, like, being online as much as I'm online, like, you see things mm. and it's, like, just so deeply concerning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
So one question that I ask everybody that comes in is what is your most valued, cherished item of clothing? Mm -hmm. And you brought something in with I you, have. which is epic. Yeah. Can you tell us what it is? Yes, I have it here. I don't want you to judge me because it's so old. No judgment. It's, like it's clean, mm -hmm. but it's stained. Yeah. There's holes in it. Mm -hmm. It's falling apart. Yeah. But I'll never get rid of it. So it is. Oh my this god. Old oh my gosh, that is epic. Right. Okay. There isn't even a crazy story behind it. I uh -huh. just love it. I love it. I actually I love it. Love oh my it. god, so, it's so thin. It's so, so thin. thin. And like look, I wish I could say that these were here before I bought it because it's it's vintage. Yeah. Um, I made these okay. because I wore it so much. Yeah. The holes are all me, baby. But look at the Hershey's characters. I know, in and there. you can tell it's really old because this was all like Glitter. Was it? Was it? You got it oh, in New York, did you say? I did. Yeah. I got it in New York. My first trip there when I was, it was 2016. So mm -hmm. I was 21. Oh, ages ago. So I got it then. And to me, like that was at the end of a really big trip I'd done. I'd mm -hmm. done six months overseas and um, four months of those were solo. Yeah. And I had just gone thrifting in East Village. I remember so specifically where I was. And I found this t-shirt and I bought, it was $2. And I bought it just because oh it God. was like the perfect fitting baby tee. It's so cute. And it's come with me. I think it's the only, one of the only pieces of clothing that's come with me all these years. I've moved house like nine times and it's come with me. I haven't worn it. I love it. Maybe in the last two or three years, but I just don't think I can ever you should part frame it. with it. You should frame it. Maybe I should frame yeah, it. Yeah, you should. You should frame it. I don't know if Joey would like that. Who cares? Frame it. <laughs> He's very specific about his art. Yeah. There's a little bit of Hershey in all of us. Oh, uh, yeah, there is. Isn't it nice? Yeah. And they're doing a dance. And they've got the kisses and the Reese's pieces. Yeah, yeah. and they're doing a little dance. I love it. I don't think I'll ever find a T-shirt that no, you like, won't. fits me better yeah. and feels better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mm. get that. I get that. Thank you so much. So, 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 Thank so much. I, it's just been such a pleasure. A so, lovely chat. Yes. The pleasure is all mine. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Um, I think that's it, right? Cool. Okay. Thank you so much.